Our first speaker hails from Ashland, Kansas, where he and his family have raised Angus cattle for four generations. As president of Gardner Angus Ranch, Mark Gardner guides the family's day-to-day -day care of the herd, crop production, and native grasslands. The GAR prefix, or the Gardner Angus brand, represents one of the premier Angus seed stock operations in, the, in America and has, been, and has been that way for nearly six decades. Mark's father, Henry, in fact, was on the Certified Angus Beef Board of Directors from 1991 to 93 during those extremely important formative years of the brand. Now, in his own right, Mark has also held leadership roles with the American Angus Association, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Seed Stock Council, Kansas Angus Association, and the Beef Improvement Federation. Mark's steadfast leadership is equally important on the ranch, where he and his wife, Eva, and their three sons cherish their way of life, its rewards, and the challenges it sometimes brings. Mark is here to tell us his story and share his hope for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Gardner. Mark, you dead, brother. Well, good morning, everybody. 1,120,000,000 pounds. My goodness, thank you so very, very much. You know, a lot of my Angus buddies right over here, and, you know, and, and they talked about Henry, and he loved to heard that, but one of the things that John maybe missed was that uh, he was on the board of directors in 1978. The first meeting he went to was when Certified Angus Beef was started. And I, you know, Henry used to get lots of accolades and Mick and all those guys, and it'd be, I said, you know, Dad, uh, you guys get a lot of accolades today, but you started that because you were in big trouble. <laughs> we were the shorty blacks. We were the discriminated cattle. We were the cattle that nobody wanted. And I remember being in high school at that time, and he'd go with Mr. Frankie Flint to Angus meetings, and then in about 1979 or 1980, he said, Mark, this certified Angus beef is really, really important. We need it for our future, for sustainability. That's the buzzword today, is sustainability. And to me, sustainability means if I can make a living and you can make a living, we're all in this together. And you board of directors over there, you've got important, important decisions as you lead, lead our breed and lead our beef industry. And if you don't think these decisions matter, on two different occasions, two different occasions, Dad said, we're going to vote on whether to keep CAB or not. I said, what do you think, Dad? Do you think, you think it's going to, going to make it? He said, I don't know, but I'm for it and we need to do it. Because it was costing $40,000 a year, $40,000 a year. So it survived by one vote two different times, 1,120,000,000 pounds. Thank you so very, very much. You know, I read an article this morning, I'll, I'll butcher the name, but Frank Neely Keeney, the New York Knicks, and he got to meet Michael Jordan when he was 15 years old. And he said, Michael, what's the key to success? And Michael's answer was prophetic. You have to love this more than you love anything else. And I would suggest to you that this industry, this country, and this way of life, we have to cherish it, we have to love it. Now, Henry and all of us are proud of this picture. This is in 1898 in Clark County, Kansas. If you'll notice where my mom and sister-in-law are sitting, that cowboy is in the exact same location. So if we use the information, if we use the science and technology, Dad was really proud of how we'd been able to change the grass. And I would say to him today, we've even changed it more because we had a very big controlled burn earlier this spring that we're going to talk about. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. So as we go forward and we look about it and we think about it, it's a, it's a family operation. 
It's a family operation, and you guys are family operations. I got to see the award winners and the, what you were doing with all your enthusiasm and your love of the product, but most importantly, the love of the family. Now, this is Henry, and we're going to talk about Henry's rules, and uh, that's Ralph on the horse there. And Ralph was actually born in a duck out that my family, his family, homesteaded in 1885. Now, a lot of you may not know what a dugout is, but in Kansas, we don't have many trees, and certainly in 1885, there weren't any trees. They had a lot of fires back then, too. So a dugout is a hole in the ground. So my granddad was born in a hole in the ground. And much like your families, they lost that place. They lost two or three other places, but they got back up and they kept going again. So for my Angus buddies, that's the grand champion Carlota Steers at the American Royal back in the 50s. So Henry was an enthusiast. But the bottom line is, I learned this from a student just recently, and I grew up, all I wanted to do was breed Angus cattle. That's all I wanted to do, because I'm pretty shy. I'm the introvert of my family, and it's like, all I'm going to do is be with cattle. And so you like that, too. And I'm like, you know, what a student taught me this year, and I've learned the last 30-some years is, I've noticed that every animal, every beef animal, is connected to a human being. And that's really what we have here in the United States is it's about people. It's about working together to make solutions. So our family operations, oftentimes, you know, we're located in an area where there's just not very many people. And you can read as well as I can. We have a relatively large ranch because we don't have any rain. We run a lot of cows. We have four production sales a year now. But the bottom line is, people say, you know, several of you know my brother Greg and Garth, and, and they go, how y'all get along? I said, we don't. <laughs> but one of Henry's rules is, at the end of the day, we can fight, and we can discuss, and we can give sign language as to what's important, but we have to stay together. And I think as we look at this country today, we can discuss, we can disagree, but we've got to move forward and we've got to work together. So the bottom line is, if you're going to be in the beef business, if you're going to be in any business, whether you're sell selling beef or bulls, you have to produce the right product to help your customers reach their goals. So what are their goals? We're going to talk a little bit about beef before we get into the fire. And my cattle people in here, you know this, but I work very hard to create cattle that will do these things in whatever environment. These people are like family. These are our customers, the Means family from Van Horn, Texas. We complain when we only get 16 to 18 inches of rainfall in Milford. They get about 8 inches a year. But in the beef business, fertility, reproduction is the number one performance trait. We have to have a live calf. I had a mentor that said, dead calves have a distressingly low growth rate, okay? So we've got to make sure we design cattle that are born alive. And uh, John didn't mention, but I'm a part of a group called U.S. Premium Beef. And we designed that system of U.S. Premium Beef. Maybe we should consider what we're designing on a cattle basis with the end in mind. Why don't we create something that our consumer wants? And then we need the maternal function to replicate the process in whatever environment it is. So as we look at this and we go forward to produce the pounds in the right package, I would suggest to you that what can we do if I can make the most money possible for my customers, if I understand how he gets paid, I can succeed. So I can get that added value that makes money. So there's some of my national beef buddies in here. That's U.S. Premium Beef has ownership. That's cattlemen that have ownership in national beef. But this was from September 6th. This is a set of heifers. And let's just go through how do we make money with the product that you sell so very well for us. So let's just capture the value and let's look at that. On September 6th, the choice select spread was $2.68. Well, let's, let's look at the certified Angus beef. For each and every pound that is brought that week, it's a four-week rolling average, that's worth another $3 a hundred weight, or think of it as three cents a pound. So there's another 568 a hundred weight if we can hit those targets on this grid. So let's, let's look at the prime grade. And year in and year out, we still got the choice select spread there. We've still got the prime, and 
On September 6th, that was 34 cents a pound. That's real money. And since I've been a part of, uh, of national beef slash U.S. premium beef, the, cho the prime spread has been traditionally 18 to $20, and it's never been under double figures to my knowledge. So let's go through there, and there's an extra $36.82, 100 weight, and let's take that through, and let's see what we can do to add value. Now, these are some cattle from our place. This is the same deal, and we won't go through all the details, but let's look at why, why were those cattle worth so much more? $195 a head. Can you make more money with those cattle? Can you make a living on $195 extra per head? You really can. And the bottom line is, and you'd say, well, that CAB percentage is pretty low. I mean, they were 97, 98% choice and above, but 76% were CAB. And the real thing there was 72% uh, of those cattle were prime. The American Angus Association has the world's largest database. If we choose to use that and apply it judiciously, we can design whatever cattle we want to do. If I can do it with one, I can do it with all of them, and that's our goal. So as we look at this added value and we think about what does it all mean, and when I started with U.S. Premium Beef, my buddies out in Kansas would say, Gardner, this is just another dang old Angus thing. I said, well, I hope so. Because if it isn't and our cattle aren't good enough, I need to know what's wrong. Since 1998, 84,000 head of cattle have generated $7.6 million above the base price for our family and for our customers that have used these shares. That's $91 per head for each and every animal that we brought to National Beef. That's real money. So now we're going to change gears and we're going to look at some things. Uh, and I know they played a clip yesterday and I said, could I see what you played? I was like, okay, here we go. So <clears throat> we are very proud of our family and I consider all of you part of our family because we're all in the beef industry together. We're proud of our ranch, but the family is more important. It's those Henry's rules of are we going to get along? Are we going to figure it out? Are we going to get, get it done? And so when we look at the family, and as I said, we, we have our days, but it's important to us, and we have to look at the land, the knowledge, the values. We're going to talk a lot about values. And uh, Henry had a lot of rules. One of them was this place is not a birthright. It's a work right. And if you want to come here, you're going to have to work. Somebody said to me, Yesterday, well, so how did you get to where you, you got? I said, well, I started out hoeing trees in a tree belt and scooping out bunks and hauling hay. But the bottom line is, and my brothers and I have made investments and we've grown. And when we look at that growth in the original land there in the 60s, we kept growing because of the help of our family. And today we're a 48,000 acre ranch and you just don't do it overnight. My older brother, Greg, he said, you know, you're going to have me in debt for the rest of my life. I said, yeah, you're pretty much right. I said, remember, people gave their lives. They worked their entire life, worked incredibly hard to give us the opportunity to have a chance. And that's what you want for your families. That's what I want for my family. So when we look at this and we look at it, and that's Henry and Ralph right there. That's in the dirty 30s. He was born in 1931. And uh, that's us a few years ago. My hair's a little bit grayer now, but that's the pic last good picture we had of dad together. And so you think about it, and you think about the family, and you think about what we do and how we do it together. And these values, these values of life, you know, I've often wondered. You, th you hear about World War II and the greatest generation. You hear about the Dust Bowl. You hear about all those things. And I'm like, does our generation resemble any of those things? I never really knew. I really didn't know. You know, you'd like to think you could measure up and do things. But, you know, the reality of it is sometimes you have to have the opportunity to express it.
And this is where the talk's going to get tough for me. Because it's not, it's not emotion about the stuff that was lost. It's emotion about what God's people did for us. It's the greatest blessing in my life. This was a big fire. It could have killed hundreds and hundreds of people. We were all out amongst it. And it's the greatest blessing ever. We like to tease the Kansans that know that's Clark County, Kansas. And uh, this fire is two counties away from where the Anderson Creek fire was. And uh, this was the largest fire in Kansas history. And so we tease those guys in Barber County, our fire was bigger than your fire. So we're, it was a big fire. Clark County, Kansas has 600 and some thousand acres. It got 500,000 acres. And if you can see Gardner Angus Ranch there, I told a friend that was checking on me when that was happening, I said, well, we're pretty much in the epicenter of it. So here it comes, the stories of it all and, and how we worked through that. We were working cattle. You know, Angus buddies, we were weighing calves for 205 day weight. We had all the horses and, you know, we had a bunch of interns with us and the wind was blowing 60, 70 miles an hour and our boys were having fun telling them. They go, is, it, is this really pretty windy? We said, oh, it's not too bad. It, uh, it, it might be a little bit breezy, but it was blowing and it was dirty and it was nasty and we smelled smoke. So I said, I'll go check it out. Well, this is what it looked like the next morning. And when I smelled that smoke, if I could go back, please. Thank you. I went to see where it was. And to cut to the chase, I went there. The wind was out of the south. And I thought, you yeah, know, we're okay. And one of the neighbors and I said, we better just stay out of the way. And so we, uh, I'm actually trying to go backwards, I'm sorry. I do that a lot. That's what we call progress. So we decided we better stay out of the way. And so I went home, I told Eva where it was, and I said, you know, we're okay. There was an 85-year-old lady that called Eva and said, my house is on fire and uh, it's burning down. I said, Mary, I was just there. I, I think you're okay. So Eva and I got in the truck and we turned around and we went back and, and uh, we were two miles headed that way. And if you can really envision flames that are this tall, uh, to the roof, two miles from our house. I said, oh my God, there it is. And so we turned around, we called everybody, grab the horses, get out of here, get as fast as you can, get. And some of you may have seen some of the social media and things, and uh, this was where they were, I don't know how they had, I'm going like, well, you're taking pictures and you're supposed to be getting the heck out of Dodge? Come on, man. So, but they, that's them as they're taking off. And my brother stole, took the other trailer because we still had three horses at my house and we were trying to get out of it. So long story short, we went down there and uh, everything was on fire. We, we went into it and, and uh, we got the horses up to the barn and that seemed safe because there wasn't much fuel there. And ultimately uh, we went into the house, tried to save our dogs and, and uh, get some things. And I lost Eva in there. And so uh, I knew her pickup was parked in the front and I looked out and I saw that her pickup was gone. So I'm thinking, you know, I can't see because of the smoke and uh, I probably better focus and get out of here. But I had a couple tasks that I wanted to do and those tasks ended up being, I grabbed some baby pictures off of our, our dresser. Uh, Eve and I write notes to each other, I grabbed those. And I came running out and I couldn't see and I fell down. They made fun of me because I lost my hat. It was a 30 year old hat and my brothers go, you couldn't even keep your hat on. And as that went across there and I saw that and I thought, you know, I don't need that hat. So I jumped in the pickup, threw in and, and oftentimes when you think about the good Lord and how he prepares you and Eva would tell you, I am a doofus, okay? I get up early in the morning and we don't have a carport or a garage and a lot of times there's frost there and I can't see. Okay, so I'm like, she goes, why don't you scrape it off or this, that, and the other. I said, oh, it's a lot of fun because she'd sit there and go, you're an idiot. And I go, yeah, pretty much. But we have a gravel road around our house and long story short, I would open the door every morning, go to work in the dark and I would watch that 
gravel road. I'm a K-State graduate. Come on now, we can figure this out. <laughs> so you think about it, and, and all these memories, it was, it was night to me because it was so black I couldn't see. And I said, uh, good Lord, get me out of here. So I follow that road out. And of course, you know, if I know where I am, I know where I am. I know I'm okay. And the good news was I knew the barn was on fire by that time, but I followed that road out. I couldn't see a thing, and there was a back way around. The fire had already burned by, and I needed to get back and try to check on those horses and put the fire out of the barn. And so some of you may have seen my brother, and he thought I was, I mean, he pulled in there with the trailer, and he had the one way in and one way out. He had it blocked, and he felt like he was a sissy for turning around with those 60-foot flames and uh, he was pretty distraught. And they, they, they found me down there throwing buckets on the, the barn. And he came there and he called me a son of a gun. And, uh, and he did this social media and he kind of broke down and this and that. And I said, man, if I had watched that beforehand, I'd have really been scared. So it probably wasn't the wisest thing I ever did. But what we had to do at that point was to move forward. And, and these are some of the finest Angus cows that we had ever raised to that point. But you, th you want to know why it's a blessing? We buried cows. And I have a theory called the Dorito theory. If you'll buy these cattle, I'll make some more. And we had our lives. We had our loved ones. And that's not true for everybody. So as we look at that and we move forward, and you think, well, that's, you're pretty bad on PowerPoint, Mark. I have three of our men are on the rural fire departments. This was a picture that they took as they ran to the fire. That's all they could see. And so when you look at our community, it's really like your communities, what you do to make a living and what you care about and cherish, it's really about the people. So 85% of the income in our county comes from cattle. There are way more cattle than there are people. So, like I said, our fire was bigger than Barber County's, more than 500,000 acres, 85% of it. You know, we lost about 10,000 head of cattle as a community. 30 homes were lost. You know, there were actually seven deaths in Kansas and Texas. And, you know, you think about the cattle and you think about how come they couldn't get away? And as we went there and we looked at it and we saw all that death and destruction, and, and we were all amongst it for the next 48 hours, we were looking at that and we were saying, you know, if the coyotes and the jackrabbits and the deer can't get out of the way, you know, that's why they couldn't get out. And when you think about a fire that extends 35 miles north to south and that's moving with an energy of 80 to 100 miles an hour, it's a big fire. So when you look at the cost of it all, there were over 4,000 miles of fence lost. That's an estimated cost right there of $41 million. You know, uh, the largest ranches lost the majority of those cattle. We lost 600 cows, which uh, those 600 cows, they were calving or had just calved, so you actually lost the cow and the calf inside of it. And so when you look at uh, taxes and, and just running, you guys know how to run businesses. You know, and I remember during the night as we were fighting fire and we were all up, out there doing that, I'm going like, those, I knew everything was gone. I knew the fences were gone. And like, it'll be years before we can ever replace this. And so when we look at it, and this is actually, uh, oh, many of you have been there on the Cattle Friends, but if you look at this and you look at where it is, I mean, these are dead cows right here. My house was down over here. Here's that road that goes in one way in and one way out. And ultimately, you know, and you think about this fire, this overhead of it, that wasn't started by fire. That was started by the heat as it blew through this tree belt and ultimately set. We lost 7,000 big bales of hay. People said, you should have had it scattered out. I said, I had it scattered out over 25 miles. Don't you think that was enough? I did. So, and, and people even here this week, they've said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, what are you sorry for? 
What are you sorry for? Well, your house and everything else. No. That's just stuff. This really uh, is truly been a blessing to know that we can step up. But more so, you know, some of my friends over here would say, you're kind of a cynic sometimes, Gardner. I'm not anymore. God had his hand on our family and our community. And when I look at where we were there as a family, and that's the same location, we didn't lose anything. We didn't lose a single thing. And as we look at towards the future, this calf was born the next morning. And my sons were, were out gathering cattle. We had one pasture. This was actually it. There were uh, 226 pregnant cattle out of there. And we came out of there with 22 head. And uh, but this is an important cow to us. There's hope. There's hope because people cared. And so when we look at, are we preparing the next generation? Are we working towards, when we look at our industry, 94 million head last year of cattle, we look at 913,000 cattle operations. And when I watched you guys win your awards yesterday, it was mainly families. And one of the things, even when it's a business, that's a family. The American Angus Association is a family. Kind of like my family. How y'all get along? Well, sometimes we have discussions. So when we look at that and we think about it, 91% are family owned. That's America. That's America. And this is where it really gets tough for me. Because the next morning, people kept coming and coming. Excuse me, how about those wildcats? When you look at that and you see all these customers that are bringing their precious resources, lots of the Dakotas came, they were having a major drought. They're bringing things to help you because they care. It was spring break for most of the kids in Kansas, kids from all over the United States, but especially Kansas and Oklahoma. They came and rolled up wire. They came and helped. And they, they worked for days and days on end. There are no substitutes for relationships in anything you do. None of us expected to be made whole. I thought it'd take us 10 years to, to replace some of the infrastructure, but because of the love of God and the people he sent to help us, the relationships in agriculture, we will have... 270 miles of fence repaired and replaced, we hope, by Christmas. So when you look at the fire, and this is April 18th of 2017, basically 45 days after the fire, we get about 16 to 18 inches of rainfall. We've had 20 inches since April. It's really good. It's as good as it could possibly be. And so, uh, remember those 22 cows I told you that we saved? This is one of them. This is her calf. The will to live, the will to be a servant of your family, of your country, and our Lord knowing that all those things are so real. My goodness, it's amazing. So when you look at this, and this is that calf, and uh, you look at the hope, and you look at the relationships, and you look at the love, I still to this day, seeing those dead cows, I should have done better. I should have saved them. But I couldn't. But I can save I mean, God was good to us because their relationships are people. We got no problems. We have the greatest opportunity in our history to make things better. And that's what we all in this room have. You know, one last thing about Henry. And he said, 
We can do this. So let's get to doing it. Thank you very much.